Hi, my name is Yasmin Cherehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Today's show is about the healing art of shiatsu and why it's important. On this show, we'll be featuring our guest, Peter Skrivanik. Peter has been a practitioner of shiatsu and reiki for over 20 years, a former director of the Shiatsu School of Canada. He is now a doctoral candidate in anthropology at the University of Toronto, whose research focuses on the production and transformation of embodied knowledge in globalizing East Asian medical practices. He currently lives in Kyoto, Japan with his family, where in addition to lecturing in universities, he maintains a private clinical practice. He is also a teacher of Komo Reiki Do, a Japanese Reiki tradition, who runs classes both in Japan and globally. He brings to his Reiki teaching a wealth of clinical experience and an informed understanding of Japanese traditional medical and spiritual healing traditions. So welcome, Peter. We're so excited to have you on the show. (laughs) Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you. So I'm really excited uh, to have you on the show today because I actually know very little about shiatsu. Um, I've heard the term. I think many people have heard the term. We've heard it in relationship to massage. Um, So I know, you know, you're like one of the global leading experts in the space. Uh, So I'd love to hear from you. What exactly is shiatsu? And are there different schools of thought? Uh, Can you describe this space to us. Sure. So shiatsu is a Japanese bodywork modality. Um, The basic technique is sustained and comfortable pressure to the body administered typically by the thumbs, sometimes the palms, or even other appendages, depending on the style. Uh, It literally means shi and atsu, finger pressure. So it's two ideograms conjoined and that basically describes the technique. It emerged in the 20th century in Japan, um, and it grew out of traditional medical practices, which have a long history, um, and their encounter with Western medicine, modern medicine, and even things like chiropractic. So as Japan opened up to the West, there was this inflow of new information, new ideas, and new models of therapy. And in this interaction, Um, shiatsu emerged. And um, you asked, are there different schools of thought? I mean, this is interesting, and it's one of the questions that I looked at in my research, is in this effort to bridge kind of Western medical models and traditional East Asian medical models. um, It's not such a straightforward task, and in a sense, the work of bridging these two things has never fully been accomplished, and that's shown up in a diversity of styles and approaches within shiatsu. So if I had to describe this, I'd say there's there's a fundamental divide. There's two basic styles. Um, uh, one is one which is most prominent in Japan, uh, sees shiatsu as something like um, akin to physiotherapy or massage therapy. It understands the body through the lens of Western medical science. And so shiatsu's effect is described or explained through its impact on the nervous system, on local tissue, on structure, skeletal structure and alignment, these kinds of things. Um, The other approach uh, draws upon uh, notions from traditional East Asian medicine. So ki, which is the Japanese uh, way of saying qi, which we're more familiar with from Chinese medicine or tai chi, these kind of things. Energy, sometimes described that way in English. Um, Meridian pathways, points of acupuncture, these kinds of things. So that figures more in a different style of shiatsu. Interestingly, that style which favors the East Asian medical practices, that's more popular in the West, in Europe and North America, whereas the style that, that, you know, um, foregrounds biomedical, Western medical um, features is what's prevalent here in Japan. Um, So yeah, that's the basic lay of the land. Wow, interesting. Um, So I'm curious, you know, you mentioned that it has impact on the nervous system. And um, can you talk a little bit about that specifically before we dive into, you know, why we think this topic is important? Sure. So in the early post-war years, um, 
<laughs> this could be a very long conversation, but to sort of <laughs> shorten it, um, Japan was occupied by the United States, and um, uh, the occupying forces had a number of objectives. I mean, one of them was to change the Japanese political structure and to uh, promote something like a, uh, a liberal democracy, and one, of course, that was you know more friendly to the West. Um, Another thing they did was they the forces looked at what was happening in Japan as a nation and they sought to kind of intervene in and to modernize the public health infrastructure. And so S, called, SCAP, the Supreme Command of the Allied Powers, that was General MacArthur's office, they sent public health people out to Japan to do surveys about what was happening in the Japanese health landscape. And they came back with um, reports of an abundance of different kinds of therapies. Among them were things like anma, which was the traditional massage in in Japan. And that was often practiced by the blind, as was acupuncture. And they thought this, the, the notion, I think, of blind, like non-sighted practitioners practicing acupuncture and massage was startling for them. And in some of the published reports, I mean, they used words like barbaric, to describe these medical practices. And so there was a move to ban them outright. And so people mobilized. And one of the things they did was to try to explain these traditional therapies in ways that, you know, these health authorities, public health authorities could understand. So some Japanese physicians and researchers said, we don't quite know exactly yet how this works, but these are some of our theories. And so a temporary reprieve was given for some of these therapies and research was actively pursued, um, um, led by certain Japanese scholars. And the people who researched shiatsu um, were also trying to figure out how shiatsu was different from the traditional anma form of massage out of which it grew. Anma features a lot of rubbing and circular pressure, where shiatsu is this stationary sustained pressure. The most marked difference that they found was the impact upon the nervous system in that shiatsu technique uh, profoundly influenced the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. This is commonly called like the rest and repair branch versus the fight or flight branch. So it tends to um, you know send blood a bit deeper, like away from the, ex like the extremities and the muscles, more into the organs. It promotes a resting response. And that was quite different from the other massage uh, that was investigated. And it was deemed a significant enough clinical finding that it ultimately led to not only shiatsu being regulated, but being recognized as a discrete uh, modality all on its own. So short, short version of this, right? It tends to promote the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic branch, the rest or repair. How that feels as a patient is... Typically, after a treatment, people will feel deeply rested, sometimes a bit cold, um, sleepy, um, sometimes quite tired, like they just need to go have a nap. Um, but this is the impulse is that the body's doing things kind of inwardly to rest and repair itself. Why do you think this topic is important? I mean, why has uh, shiatsu gain such popularity globally? I could answer that two ways. I think once one as like a as a researcher, um, I think it's important and interesting just because of the like the historical context I talked about, that that encounter, how Western medicine encounters traditional medicine and what happens then. We're 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 in a time where biomedicine is is global and everywhere in the world traditional medicines have to contend with biomedical categories, um, biomedical power, and they have to sort of recreate themselves in, in light of the pronounced understandings of the body and illness that biomedicine provides. And I just find that kind of negotiation kind of interesting and, and significant. More broadly, I mean, as someone who's also been a practitioner, um, you know, I love shiatsu because of how it makes me feel <laughs> and how it <laughs> makes people feel. Um, my my first treatment um, happened while I was in Japan. I came to Japan after I graduated um, from university for a short stint as a as a teacher, and I went and got a treatment. 
and I'll never forget it. I mean, I felt utterly different. I remember uh, walking home alongside the river and uh, realizing that, my God, I, I'd been in a hunched posture for most of my life, but suddenly now I had this this freedom structurally. I was My posture was naturally more erect. I was breathing in a way that it was full, and I, I just I hadn't done that before. And the colors seemed brighter. I don't know. Kids were flying their kites above the river. It was kind of a wah wah moment, but it was, but it was definitely um, it made this powerful impact on my sense of embodied awareness, and that's what stayed with me. And I think people who are looking for more, like body mind integration, or for um, ways to recognize and support um, a more holistic way of being in the world, modalities like shiatsu can be very, very helpful. Wow. I, w- I want to go schedule a shiatsu appointment <laughs> right now after your <laughs> explanation. You know, I think... <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I've, I've noticed that a lot of different um, places offer shiatsu, and I'm thinking that not all of them are created equal in at least the United States. And um, I'm just curious, you know, when you go in to get a shiatsu treatment, is there some type of certification that we should be looking for? That's a great question. Um, And it really depends on your jurisdiction. So there's a standard for training in Japan, and that's really only available in Japan through a Japanese vocational school. Outside of Japan, it's taken very different courses. So um, I, I did my study in Ontario, uh, Canada, which actually had probably the highest standard of training outside of Japan. My program was 2,200 hours. It was two years full time. And it was extensive. A, a lot of sciences, a lot of, you know, everything. We had a, a basic like pre-med school biomedical education, you know, what you might get if you're going in to be like a dental hygienist or or a nurse practitioner or something. So a a fairly decent understanding of anatomy, physiology, pathology, all these sorts of things. And then the practical training and in in shiatsu itself. But there are in most jurisdictions, not necessarily laws that cover that. So people have been fairly free to create their own programs. Um, so, you know, in in the United States, you have the, what is it, the AOBTA, what's it, the American Organization, uh, Asian Bodywork Therapies, I'll have to, I'll have to look that up again, I'm forgetting right now, but it's an American Organization for the body Bodywork Therapies of Asia, I think, and it's an umbrella organization that has information about different kinds of, you know, East Asian medical modalities, and may give more information about what certification looks like and maybe they've tried to enact some national standards but i know in the past anyways what was happening in california was very different from what was happening in new york and in canada it was much the same what was happening in ontario was different from what was happening in british columbia or quebec or anywhere like that it was more provincially run in in canada so you'd have 2200 hours as a standard of, of training in ontario maybe 500 hours in another jurisdiction Um, so that's kind of where it is because, uh, shiatsu remains in, in many places, it's a minority tradition, right? It's not recognized. It doesn't have the kind of, um, clout of something like massage therapy, which in many jurisdictions is quite highly regulated. Um, so that's, it's a little bit caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. Um, right. Ask your ask your practitioner where did you study when how long have you been practicing these are important questions anytime I think we're approaching alternative medicine mm, um, yeah where regulation is is often very much you know it's, it's like the wild west right you know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah because I I've noticed a lot of places that claim that they do shiatsu and then the way that you described it I was like I don't think I've ever actually gotten a shiatsu treatment. <laughs> So, um, right. uh, what, what kind of person seeks, uh, shiatsu just based on, on your experience? Right. Again, that's an interesting question because it depends where you are. Um, 
in the West, I mean, I mean here North America and Europe, um, I guess the majority of the patients are women. Um, I think in general, women tend to see complementary and alternative medicine more often than men do. Um, this has been cited in numerous studies, and there's probably multiple reasons for this. Um, I think it's worth noting that in in the West, uh, women also tend to practice what we might call holistic forms of spirituality uh, more eagerly and more often than men do. Um, and that's a pretty wide category that would include things from like spa treatments to meditation retreats. And I think shiatsu would fit there for many people. So it's partly part of a, um, I mean, it's like a number of things. It's related to consumer culture and, you know, the idea that there are, you know, we are what we consume. And, and you know, if we're someone who's consuming exotic sounding modalities, that's part of a cosmopolitan identity. But it's also something that people are looking for. They're looking for ways to feel more connected, ways to feel well. So it's 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 circulating in those kind of areas because it has a number of different meanings. It's very different than in Japan. If you come to Japan, shiatsu is more understood as a modality for old people, <laughs> which was um, a, a bit of a shock for me. When I was living in Japan the first time, you know, I had that treatment I mentioned and I got really excited about it. I started to study informally with some teachers here. And I told you know, some of my colleagues at the school where I was teaching, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to study shiatsu. And, and they were so puzzled. They're like, why? <laughs> you seem like you seem like a clever guy. You know, this, this seems it's just for old people. And I, and I was really puzzled because I was reading works about it in English where it had this deep philosophical underpinning. And I, I there was this disconnect that I didn't quite understand. Um, but it's partly about the generation here where shiatsu gained prominence and um, became well-known and um, sort of well-regarded by people. And, and it hasn't maintained the same high profile. Um, and um, so, and it's sometimes you might see this, that, you know, in different countries in India or something, you know, I mean, some people might say, well, like Ayurveda, well, maybe my grandparents are more into that, but younger people are more into other alternative medicines or in contemporary modern medicine, right? It might seem a bit old fashioned, for some people in Japan who are looking elsewhere for something that's new and exciting. Whereas in the West, what's new and exciting is typically something from outside, which might be something like shiatsu or, you know, Thai massage or, or something else like that. So there's partly, you know, we live in a consumer society. So the things that we tweak onto and become aware of, there, there's reasons why we become aware of them. Um, but that's not the full story. I mean, if we become aware and try it and enjoy it, that that has something else. There, like there are other reasons for that. Fascinating, Peter. So you studied both shiatsu and reiki. I'm uh, curious. Mm. Are they complementary? Uh, how are they different? You could just share that with the audience. We had um, Justin on on a couple uh, episodes earlier who spoke about reiki. Uh, but I think it would just be great to get a sense from you how, you know, what Reiki is and how they're different and if they are complementary. And, um, yeah, just curious why you studied both modalities. Yeah, I mean, the relationship between Reiki and Shiatsu is is interesting. And I think the full story has yet to be written. Um, there, there's a scholar here in Japan whom I was speaking to and and he was pointing out for me some of the linkages between these two modalities, which I myself had not been aware of previously. So there, there's work to be done there, but they both arise around the same time. So um, Mikao Sui, the founder of Reiki, sort of brings it out around 1923, if memory serves. Uh, Justin Stein would be the person to, to go to about that. Shiatsu, the first book written about Shiatsu is published in 1919. So within four years. So they both emerge in this same period where, again, there's been um, a pronounced influx into Japan of material from the West, sciences, um, even, you know, political organizations and structures, all kinds of ideas, books. Japan has become newly literate. And, um, you know, there's like a, a novel education. There's a newly formed middle class who are learning how to read. 
And even now today, Japan's literacy rate is among the highest in the world. And all these people want to read, well, they need stuff, right? And so right. translated material from, from the West was really intriguing for people. And um, so a lot of stuff was circulating. And on one sense, there was like a reaction where people who were involved with more you know, traditional modalities wanted to preserve or to push forward um, what they were familiar with and maybe to try to translate it or broker it in into this new language and these new terms that were suddenly circulating. Anyway, so that that's just a bit of background, pardon me. They, they come from a similar milieu. Um, they're different in that shiatsu is body work, okay? And it's it's typically it involves pressure. So it's pressing onto the body, leaning onto the body, most therapists would tell you, not using muscular strength, but your whole body weight. And working through the body from, you know, head to toe, front to back, um, applying this pressure. So there, there, there's a physical pressure. Reiki tends to be, you know, you just rest your hands on the person. So the, the idea of Reiki is that the, the practitioner is holding and channeling kind of universal life energy, Reiki, into the patient. In Shiatsu, it's, it's more mechanical. Although there are ideas of key, the practitioner may be sharing some key or at least identifying places in the patient's body mind where key is stuck. So for people who practice um, um, a style of shiatsu that focuses on the meridians and on East Asian medical theory, Re Reiki is a very natural complement. It's, it's working on these same energetic structures, but just with a slightly different approach. Um, so in that sense, they're very complementary. If people draw a very hard line about shiatsu, like some practitioners in Japan do, and say, no, it's an anatomical therapy, some of these practitioners don't believe in ki, they call it superstitious, then they'll, they'll say the same thing about reiki, and they'll say it has nothing to do with shiatsu. So um, it really depends politically how people stand. You know, for me, um, as I became more personally interested in the kind of... Um, East Asian medical aspect of shiatsu, so meridians, points, energy. Um, I was doing my own self-cultivation to enhance my sensitivity and my ability to work with this effectively for my patients. And and Reiki fit with that. It, it's To me, it, it is as much a self-cultivation practice as it is a therapeutic modality. And... Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, began my study of Reiki, you know, that that's a really interesting process um, that, you know, different people experience differently, but it can open up certain kind of perceptions or kind of sensory skills for people. And that fed into my shiatsu practice and inclined me to keep searching and practicing and training to work more effectively with ki in mm. my patients. Beautiful. So, uh, Peter, when a patient walks in, can you actually walk us through what the entire process looks like uh, for treatment? You know, do is there an intake? Um, you know, how does that work? Is it just kind of one size right. fits all? <laughs> well, again, depending on how people are trained, I think there is variation. Certainly, um, you know, in my training, uh, quite a premium was placed on uh, that professional aspect of therapy, taking good intake, keeping good records, you know, inquiring about medications, uh, you know, liaising even with GPs. I mean, I've spoken to my patients, you know, uh, primary health providers before to explain what the therapy was and to, uh, to talk to them about a treatment plan. I mean, that, that was part of the training or what the training aspired to. Um, but basically, yeah, you sh there should be some kind of intake process when the person comes in to inquire both about any presenting complaints and why they're coming for therapy, but also, you know, any, you know, health history information that's important. Um, once that's done, and then the therapist ought to explain to you if it's your first visit, what shiatsu is, what it entails. Um, the treatment can start in short order. Clients remain clothed in shiatsu. It's the treatment is administered through clothing, often even with like maybe a light sheet over top of the person. Um, 
And it may be performed on a massage table, or it may be performed on a futon on the floor, um, depending on how that practitioner trained and, uh, and you know, what the style of, of their clinic is. And then, you know, basically, again, the basic idea is it's, it's a whole body treatment of sustained, ideally comfortable pressure to points distributed across the whole body that may occur in a certain kind of sequence. And depending on the patient's complaint, the therapist will modify that to maybe focus on local areas. Right? They may incorporate stretching or range of motion testing or, you know, Maybe someone will add a bit of Reiki, but strictly speaking, shiatsu will be pressure and stretching. And usually it lasts about you know, 50 minutes to an hour, depending on the, um, on the practitioner and the, the circumstances of their practice. People who practice the more uh, East Asian-influenced model of shiatsu will do um, abdominal diagnosis. This was a very prominent um, innovation developed by a, a famous therapist called Shizuto Masanaga. And this in, uh, consists of gently palpating zones of the abdomen to try to feel if they're replete or deficient. And this is how shiatsu therapists read the function of the meridians in the body. So it's, it's akin to what acupuncturists do when they, they feel the pulse. They're trying to determine, okay, what, what systems are most out of bounds. With shiatsu, it's touch-based on the abdomen, which in general is, is a modality that has a long history in Japan. Abdominal diagnosis is probably the most distinctive difference between Chinese-style medicine in Japan and in China. Um, and it's uh, certainly since like the Edo period, like the 1600s, it became uh, very prominent, although it, it predates that as well. Fascinating. Yeah, I've, I've actually never encountered anyone who's done that abdominal test uh, in the West. And I've tried many, many different <laughs> types of modalities. So that's super interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, very mm. interesting. It's, it's not easy, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, not easy to learn. But, um, uh, you know, and different people, you know, have built on the work of that, that innovative founder, um, Masanaga Sensei. And, carry that diagnostic practice in different directions. Um, I had the good fortune to study with Tetsuro Saito, who was um, a, a great, great therapist. We call him the father of shiatsu in Canada. He came to Canada in um, the late 60s, early 1970s, I guess early 1970s, and you know introduced the practice of shiatsu. And he was a lifelong researcher, building upon the work of his teacher, um, Masanaga. And, uh, you know, he, kind of astonishing what, you can learn about someone through when you become very accomplished at this practice. And he was someone who certainly was. And um, I count the time I spent studying with him as, as a real gift in my life. You know? Beautiful. Wow. I think uh, since I live in the United States, I'm curious, maybe I'll ask you later about recommendations of maybe you know, folks that you know in, in the United States who, who can do this type of okay. <laughs> abdominal tapping. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yes. I have some ideas. You'll have to do some, some searching, but I think we can find them. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Peter, can you tell us about any interesting stories about patients who've worked with shiatsu and maybe, you know, surprising stories, like things that have surprised you in, in this journey? Oh, sure. No, there's, there's a bunch. <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> you know, maybe the, the first one was very shortly after I graduated. And I think this is, this is common, whether you're a doctor, a, a massage therapist, an acupuncturist, you know, you've, you've gone to school, you've done the formal training, you, you've earned your qualification, but now you're practicing and it, it's terrifying <laughs> because you get something like imposter syndrome because you realize that you've got this intellectual knowledge, but you don't have a lot of clinical experience yet. Well, you only get that through practice and practicing on people. So, you know, self-doubt is, um, I think, pretty par for the course in that early phase of, of practice. And that was certainly the case for me. Can I really do this? Am I good enough? You know, these kinds of questions. Um with a, a classmate, we started a little company. Um, we called it Shiatsu on Site, right? SOS. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we, we, we'd visit, yeah, you see, uh, we, we'd visit uh, different companies and do corporate Shiatsu. So we'd bring massage tables in and 
employees would book 15 or 20 minute kind of stress buster treatment. So I didn't really think of this as therapy in the way that I do a long treatment and do a, like a, a full intake and diagnosis. And it was more like a, a short stress buster kind of treatment. Okay. You're, you're, you're tired. Let, let's do a short 15 minute thing. So you feel rejuvenated and better. So anyways, one, one uh, patient came in, she was a, a middle-aged executive in this firm and she had frozen shoulder. So but she could kind of, um, lift her shoulder you know if, if you extend your arm out in front of you and take that like along the horizon as zero degrees she probably couldn't go much like more than 10 or 15 degrees above that it was just locked and then she'd feel acute pain and couldn't move her shoulder and i and she said can you do anything for this i said well we've got 15 minutes here so <laughs> might not be able to do a lot um, and in the meantime all these you know, little voices in my head you're not good enough you can't do anything right but i said like, okay i'll do my best i'll do what i can and I always remember this because it was the first time that this happened where I was holding one point behind her shoulder and I found another point on her arm. And what I felt was just this sense of rightness. I can't really say anything more, but that I needed to hold here. I didn't know how I knew that or why I felt that. That's just what I felt. And I just started to hold these two points. And then the patient exclaimed, oh, my God, oh, my God. I said, what? She said, it's like water. She said, I feel like water is running from my shoulder down to my fingers. And I said, which finger? And she said, well, mainly the, the ring finger. And I saw her knowing the meridian trajectory. It's like, yeah, that's the pathway, the triple warmer meridian that I'm on right now. So I just kept holding those points until, you know, that flowing sensation went away. And so I was a little mystified, like, what, what was that? And, and she stood up and I said, Let, let's do the, the range of motion test again. And suddenly she could move to almost 80 degrees. She had almost full range of motion. And I, I couldn't believe it. Like I, I, what just happened? And she was, she was like, Shiatsu is amazing. And I said, look, <laughs> I, I don't know really how this happened. But yeah, wow. I mean, it, it can be like that. Occasionally these sorts of things can happen. Um, you know, I had a patient come to my clinic the, the next week with frozen shoulder. And I said, OK, I just have to find those two points. <laughs> it wasn't so straightforward. And, and progress for her was was much slower. Um, so but it was a kind of a, a, a gift experience that that really um, opened my eyes and, and gave me a boost. to say, like, OK, this modality works. And, and if I trust it and just do my best, you know, I'll be able to help people and I'll get better and better at this as I go along. Um, one more story, if there's time for it, from my, my research, and I've written about this in one of my, my published articles. Um, a, a therapist whom I call Randall um, told me this story in an interview, and it's striking because it really shows this, this idea of the kind of the mind being in the body and this, this inseparability of the two that is a hallmark of a lot of East Asian medical thinking. So the way he told the story is a patient came to see him and um, it was her first shiatsu treatment. And she said, oh, I'm, her complaint was a sudden outbreak of eczema on her arms. And he said, well, you know, that's, shiatsu is probably not the modality of choice for that. You know, you might want to look at some herbs or, or, you know, something, or maybe even a topical corticosteroid for eczema. But you're here. And he could tell that she, she seemed stiff and a bit distant in her bearing. So she wasn't balance in her key. He said, I, I'm, you've come this way, so we can certainly do a treatment, but for your eczema, you might want to do something else. So she, she was agreeable to that. So she lays down and he starts to do this abdominal diagnosis. And briefly, the way this works is there are 12 zones that correspond to the 12 meridian pathways. And over her large intestine meridian, he said he felt this very distinct like emptiness. He said it was like it was just a, a cave mm. below his fingers when he's pressing. And in, in the Chinese medical view, which you know, Shiatsu has some historical connection to, the lung and large intestine are paired, and one of the things they govern is the skin. Um, and in, in Shiatsu theory, you know, the lung and large intestine is related to this taking in and letting go. 
And so the skin's permeability also has this function. And in shiatsu, this operates both physically but also psychologically. Okay, so that's going to be important later. So he says, okay, hmm, large intestine, also the skin, there's a connection. And he just suddenly asks her, any, any issues with constipation? And her eyes kind of open in surprise. She said, how did you know that? But yes, actually, she said, I haven't been able to have a bowel movement for a few days. He said, okay, that's just interesting. But something in how she spoke in her tone in, kind of nudged him to inquire a bit deeper. And so pressing the zone again, he said, any issues in your relationships about letting go? And the way he described it, she looked at him and then she started crying. She cried and cried and cried. And the story emerged three or four days previous, her fiance had suddenly cut off. Oh. They, they'd broken up. And shortly after that, this eczema outbreak happens and the constipation. And so Randall, the therapist, tells me he just, you know, put his hand on her abdomen and supported her while she cried. And he explained to her that, you know, the mind is in the body and this connection is mediated through ki. So a shock like that is, of course, going to reflect in the body via the meridian system. And that the crying was important for her to let go of the painful key of, of pain and loss. So that to me, it was, it was a lovely story where, I mean, it's, it's almost textbook. It's almost too textbook um, of how you know, this taking in and letting go reflects to the skin and how that aligns with a large intestine deficiency diagnosis in, in shiatsu theory. Um, but people who acquire skills in this method of diagnosis often are able to make these connections. And the, the, the therapists I've met who are really proficient at this have lots of stories like this, where they see this added layer behind the presenting physical symptoms, where the physical symptoms reflect something happening in the larger life process of the patient. And, um, and that's exciting to clue into, and, and, and it's often very intriguing and interesting for patients as well. Yeah. Wow, Peter. That's a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, and, thank you. And, it, you know, it's, uh, it's in the West, it feels like a lot of um, Western doctors only focus on the physical. And I think, um, you know, this practice, like Reiki and like, you know, there's a lot of other Eastern practices that uh, take in both the spiritual and the emotional body in consideration with the physical. So uh, I so appreciate um, the lens, this lens, because I think it's it's very much needed in the West. I think the West is extremely advanced when it comes to the physical, but not you know the emotional and the spiritual. So, and it's all like you said, it's interconnected. So, <laughs> right, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that that enabled scientific medicine to make such advances was precisely because it made that distinction, right? It made that separation, and and in early time of modern medicine, you know the mind or the spirit that was relegated to the church and, and early medical researchers focused on the body and they focused on, you know, doing like, you know, dissections and things like that, actually getting into the pathways of the body and representing it and looking at what, what do pathologies look like with the naked eye and then with microscopes. And so that's been the, the, the area of investigation and it's it's tremendously powerful like i'm like you i think it's brilliant you know i mean no traditional medicine's ever been able to replace a heart right, <laughs> right. Um, that, that's that's just amazing um but there there are some costs so then from the church then it went to more like psychology and and you know um you know, psychiatry to look at then the mind um but now you know there there's increasing efforts to sort of bridge these things and whether through biopsychosocial models or you know complementary alternative medicines i mean people who do shiatsu reiki or qigong are increasingly finding places within western medical health infrastructures where they can find a role you know whether it's working with people with PTSD or in in hospitals there there are trials going on in in numerous hospitals where, you know, Reiki practitioners work while someone's under surgery or while they're recuperating, you know, or people who cooperate. There's still work to be done to figure out, you know, how and why 
these things work in a way that's satisfactory for Western-minded physicians. You know, I mean, they want to know why this works, and that's a completely fair question on their part. Um, there's just a lot that we still don't know, you know, about the mind and the mind in the body. Um, but body work can really make that obvious, you know. Um, years ago, I had a different kind of treatment, um, craniosacral therapy, if you've heard of it. And the therapist began the treatment by just feeling my ankles. And I said, oh, you know, I, I feel a little something in my mid-back, a weird twin. She says, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm going there next. <laughs> okay, so then she put her <laughs> hands there. And she held under my back and on my chest. And, um, and then suddenly my body jackknifed and I sat up on the table and I started laughing. <laughs> laughing 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 and then she was laughing like it was bubbling up to her and this this went on for like three or four minutes and i'm like <laughs> what was that and she said oh that, that's that's an emotional release that's a lot nicer than crying <laughs> when it comes out that way <laughs> but it just becomes obvious you know that that emotion can be in some sense stored in the body where is our mind if not within our body and 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 that dimension of health and wellness is something that there's a lot of room left for us to investigate and understand. Yeah, could not agree with you more. <laughs> Peter, are there any books or resources that you can recommend to our audience uh, to read or check out on this particular subject or within the realm of, of the subjects that we spoke about today? Okay, well, my, my dissertation is almost done, so I have to <laughs> file that away in your memory. It's coming. It's coming. God willing. <laughs> Touch wood. Um, <laughs> Probably the most, um, there's like a few classic books in the genre. Um, uh, Todu Namikoshi, who is the son of Tokujiro Namikoshi, who is the most famous and most widely regarded, I think, uh, shiatsu therapist. Um, some would call him the founder. He was certainly tremendously influential, um, both in Japan and globally. So his son, Todu, Todu Namikoshi, wrote a book, The Complete Book of Shiatsu Therapy. And that, that's a classic. It's a bit dated. You might only be able to find it online. But it gives a really good account of this neuromuscular kind of um, more scientifically modeled shiatsu therapy. Um, then uh, Zen Shiatsu is the classic text by Shizuto Masunaga, um, who was a student of the elder Namikoshi and then developed his own uh, expression of shiatsu drawing on East Asian medicine and this more sort of slightly meditative diagnostic approach. Um, his his system in Japanese is called like ki tokeraku shiatsu, like ki and meridian shiatsu. But in the West, his book was translated with the title Zen Shiatsu, and that that label sort of stuck. So you see people who say, "I study Zen Shiatsu," or "I practice Zen Shiatsu." It's not really formally connected to. Zen Buddhist practice per se, but it draws on ideas of longstanding that do have some connection to Zen. I, I, I mentioned like this idea of Zen Shiatsu at a, at a conference here in Japan, and then the Japanese scholars were really puzzled and kind of amused. <laughs> eh, Zen Shiatsu, what would that be? But it makes sense in in the West. You know, this is this, you know. Uh, in translation, you know, moving things, moving back and forth, and things get lost in translation or they get added. And sometimes it's interesting and amusing. But, um, but Zen Shiatsu is a, um, is a very meaningful category for uh, many practitioners in, in the West. And uh, it's got a developed body of theory that's uh, really interesting. Amazing. Otherwise, sorry, one, one more book. I should, probably um, if someone's thinking of practicing it. It's a bit more technical, but uh, Shiatsu Theory and Practice uh, is the title of a book written by a therapist from the UK, Carola Beresford Cook. It's great. It, it's probably the most um, lucid presentation of, um, of kind of Zen Shiatsu Theory and connects it to Chinese medicine and uh, tells a coherent story about it. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll check that out. Um, and I'm, I imagine that these books, like the last book that you mentioned, is not a, a self-study course, right? You couldn't read the book and, and perhaps perform shiatsu, right? right? It, you need the supplement of in-person. You know, that that's interesting. I mean, the, ma the therapist I mentioned, Tokujiro Namakoshi, you know, he actually rose to fame in Japan in the 19... 
50s and 60s. He had a television show or a slot on a famous afternoon television show where he'd present simple home remedy. So shiatsu has been understood as a kind of home remedy in Japan for some time. The idea of, you know, maybe treating some special points or, or you know, massaging. And, and in, in general, massage is more familiar as a mode of self-care for Japanese people. So if you're ever in Japan and you go to a hot spring, the onsen, um, you know, this is like kind of public bathing. You, you shower and clean yourself first, and then you collectively soak in these big, large tubs. You'll often see like a like a young child being called on to rub their grandfather's shoulders mm-hmm. or something like that. And it's a very kind of natural kind of um, almost like a family ideal in Japanese society that, you know, the younger can take care of the older by massaging their shoulders. And many people develop a kind of a, a knack for that. And this so that massage as self-care is kind of not unknown here but having said that to learn to do it well you need to study with a qualified teacher because the technique is ultimately that you're applying your your body weight behind your palms or your thumbs to the patient and if you do that inappropriately like on a thoracic on like a you know cervical vertebrae or on a floating rib or something <laughs> right. you, you could cause a damage right so you need to know what you're doing you need to know what do you do if someone is you know three months pregnant do you treat or not so there are indications and contraindications that people need uh, to know about so yeah professional training is i would say essential you can do a basic course where you get enough um, instruction in how to do it safely that you can treat family and friends. I, I used to teach something like this at the Shiatsu School of Canada. We do like a a thirty hour course where we were we limited it in scope in what we taught people to do, and we were strict about what you were not to do. And then we practiced a lot so that they could safely and comfortably deliver a basic treatment. And that that's kind of as home care is is lovely, but to really realize the therapeutic benefits, you need someone with more training than that. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, Peter, how can the audience, especially, you know, this is for a global audience. uh, How can we find people that practice this art, uh, this philosophy of shiatsu? So um, basically the best way to do it is to find the um, professional shiatsu association in your region As of now, there is no global body that represents all shiatsu therapists. Um, And again, even in 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 Canada, for example, it could be there's an association on the west coast, one on the east coast. When I was practicing in Toronto, there were five different professional associations in the in the province of Ontario alone, and this reflected partly political divisions and different standards of training that schools were offering and. and, um, There was a little bit of factionalism happening. I think that is decreasing now. Um, If if one is in Europe, for example, um, they have a good system there. The ESF, the European Shiatsu Federation, is like an umbrella organization. And there's links on their webpage to uh, various national associations where there are like um, practitioner registries. In in the United States, um, again, the AOBTA, the American Organization for Body Work, Therapies of Asia, I think. I think that's the acronym. Um, but AOBTA, uh, again, they they have um, a website that explains different East Asian modalities, shiatsu included among them. And um, I think you can link to practitioners in your area. Uh, that's probably the best way. So, you know, to, to Google Shiatsu Therapy Association and then your locality would probably be the best way to start. Great. But, you know, again... Remember this caveat emptor, make sure they've got some, some good training under their belt. Right. No, we don't want anything, uh, you know, less than, what is it, 2,200 hours? <laughs> is that what you did? Well, I mean, that that was a standard in Canada at the time. There are, um, there are courses that are maybe shorter than that that might still be um, sufficient, particularly if the, the therapists, um, you know, engage in ongoing education. And I think... They should do that. There are excellent, excellent teachers out there who can tell, who can help practitioners continue to refine their skills and techniques. So, 
Um, I don't know that there's any 2200 hour programs operating in the States, for example, but I am aware, for example, of one approach where the um, people practice for years <laughs> before they're allowed by their senior teacher to practice. So um, it, 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 it varies. So um, 2200 hours is one standard. It's not the only one. Um, it has some benefits. A, a shorter standard can be fine, I think, if, you know, there's enough emphasis on safety and people commit to continuing education. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Peter, what's like the last thing you want to tell our listeners about their health and wellness? What's sort of like your main takeaway with all, all of your experience and everything you've learned? I know that's a really difficult question to ask, you know, cause it's sort mm. of just the, the high level bullet point that you would, that you would share with our audience about health and wellness, especially in 2020, given this, you know, global pandemic uh, that we're in. Right. Well, the, the pandemic makes in-person therapy challenging, doesn't it? Right. This is a, <laughs> yeah. a hard time for body workers of all stripes, I think. Um, I, I guess I, I have to, again, do this in two points. And, and maybe counterintuitively, I'd start by saying, you know, I, you know modern medicine is amazing. And, and so I don't really like to buy into the, the alternative us versus them a mindset that sometimes happens, like, you know, I'm, I'm only going to use holistic medicine. I'm not going to touch the Western. That's not my, um, that's not my philosophy. And I don't think it's necessary. I don't think we need like a fanatical degree of Puritanism about this. Um, you can benefit from Western biomedicine and, and I do so, and I, I utilize it. I just try to recognize when there's something I'm facing that isn't well served by that modality. And for me, you know, shiatsu and aligned therapies are great for how they fill the blind spots that we already talked about, about a purely physical disease-based um, model of therapy, right? There are whole um, expressions of illness that aren't disease, feeling out of sorts, feeling unbalanced, feeling off, feeling like you're not as energetic as you could be, feeling unfocused. All of these things are not necessarily signs of disease, but they're signs of not being at your best. And I think this is where, um, you know, bodywork modalities can be really, really helpful, something like shiatsu, um, to promote wellness. So people who, you know, are interested in proactively trying to understand and optimize um, their physical health, and who understand that as something that's not separated from or, ex or excluded from their mental well-being, right? Their psychological well-being, who see these things as integrated. I think they'd be, um, they would benefit from exploring something like shiatsu to see how it can help them achieve these goals and even help them maybe envision goals that they didn't know were possible. So that's, um, I guess what I'd say is, you know, you don't have to cut yourself off from biomedicine it's it's great in its area and its area is broad but um you know east asian body work modalities can be really really helpful um in making you feel better in helping you recover helping you avoid certain kinds of you know maybe pharmaceutical therapies that that, that over the long term you know like taking painkillers all the time that that have negative consequences if you can manage pain better or manage mood even better through these kind of therapies, uh, you're winning in, in the long run for sure. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Peter. And where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, about your dissertation that's coming up, about you know, <laughs> right. your la <laughs> latest and greatest updates? Uh, Okay. Well, I currently live in Kyoto, so if you're coming through Japan, <laughs> that's one thing we can be. Otherwise, um, um, you know, my practice really is, is really quite part time at the moment, um, and I'm a little bit hidden while my my nose is still in the books, trying to to finish um, my writing. You can find some of my writings on academia.edu. So just academia.edu and just search Peter Scrivanic, S K R I B A N I C. Um, that's probably the place to go for now. 
and um, I don't know, bookmark the site because uh, the dissertation will be there and then God willing, the book <laughs> in its own time. Yeah. I mean, you have such a wealth of information on this topic. I really, I really do hope you, uh, you publish a book um, because oh. yeah, I think especially in the West, we, there's a lot of confusion around Eastern practices. So we're really grateful for right. your time and yeah. And thoughtfulness um, when answering a lot of these questions. So Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about the healing art of shiatsu and why it's so important. You can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Thanks again. Thanks again.